Good morning, New York. How's everyone doing? How many maps have you seen today? <laughs> Not enough. We can fix that. Well, I'm here to fix that. There's a funny way maps, whoops, how did that happen? Back, stay. But, uh, so I'm super psyched to be here, uh, particularly because I'm on the same, I've been friends with Lucy Lepard for 20 years, which is pretty thrilling, but I don't know if we've ever done anything in public together before. So to be co-keynote with Lucy is totally thrilling. So, And uh, Lucy, who is an early Soho dweller and is actually from this neighborhood. Me, my mother was born in Brooklyn, but I'm a San Franciscan. So and I'm here to talk. My way of getting at urbanism lately um, has been through maps. And maps are ubiquitous in one sense and completely missing in another. A lot of younger people don't own maps and atlases and don't have the knowledge a map gives you. We call things like MapQuest and Google Maps on your phone interactive because they give you data. But, but are they? Are they interactive? It's a system that largely gives you instructions to obey. And certainly obedience is a form of interaction. Maybe not my favorite one. At, uh, but a paper map you take control of, use it as you will, mark it up, and while you figure out the way from here to there yourself, instead of having a corporation tell you, you might pick up peripheral knowledge, the system of street names, the parallel streets and alternate routes. Pretty soon you've learned the map, or rather you have, by a map, learned your way around the city. The map is now within you. You are yourself a map, and thus it is that all of us are atlases. Anyone, of, anyone in this room must contain hundreds of maps, of all kinds of things from your childhood home to the way you got here this morning, to the places you avoid, the places you made out as a teenager, and uh, everything in between. So I'm, uh, this is an art conference about cities. So why am I talking about maps? Because I love them, because I make them, because we need them, because they show us where we are in ways nothing else does, except that there aren't very many of them showing us anything more than the mainstream consensus of who and where we are anymore. This is a little snapshot from when I was making an Atlas of Laramie with the students at University of uh, Wyoming. And one morning I was looking at the New York, this is the New York Times, that's my coffee cup. And it was about how ubiquitous the sort of maps we hardly even notice are. And um, except that, you know, I'm not sure how many people use them, maps like that very intensively. So we have these maps that are kind of a mainstream consensus all around us now. Google Maps will show you freeway exits and people seem to add restaurants in particular to them, creating a landscape about driving and consuming. But these things are not more real than bird migration routes, incidents of violence, property ownership, or other things that are equally mappable. They teach us what to see and by extension what not to see. So we have two problems. We're spending less time with maps and the maps that we are spending time with are less likely to show us the world in any subversive and exciting ways. Google writes Evgeny Morozov in Slate, intends to start making all the maps we get from them, quote, dynamically generated and highly personalized, giving preferential treatment to the places frequented by our social networking friends, the places we mention in our emails, the sites we, isn't it nice that they have access to all your emails? And, um, you know, those of you who are foolish enough to be on Gmail, at, uh, the places we mention in our emails, the sites we look up on the search engine, Conversely, the places we haven't encountered or haven't expressed any interest in encountering will be harder to find. So the, 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 the bespoke map this will fit you like a straitjacket and not let you get outside beyond what you already know and who you already hang out with. But map, that's not what maps are for. Maps are for getting you out in the world, just like cities. They're for uh, encountering difference, or they were. So our maps work in a lot of ways. We see in election times all these red and blue state maps. This is a really cool map somebody made which showed actually the percentage of the vote, which is why Utah is like sort of fuchsia and Vermont is sort of violet, but there aren't actually any red and blue states if you look at actual popular vote. So, and maps really, the precision and specificity of information really uh, upends a lot of things. This is uh, the Western, uh, Western North America before 1848. How many of you knew that all that was Mexico, all that green stuff? At, um, how many of you didn't know all that was Mexico? California, Nevada, Utah, um, part of Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, et cetera. So um, yeah, at, uh, maps, you know, it changes the immigration debate a little bit. Maps also um, traditionally were incredibly beautiful. This is a map of Cuba with ornamental scenes around the border, kind of classic 19th century map, and then data tables and things. 
maps as they classically existed, as I'm trying to revive them, are this kind of happy collision of visual data, uh, language, and cartography, all kind of working together. They're always art as well as science. At, um, and they were beautiful, although this is either an incredibly beautiful title page or an incredibly, for an atlas of the West Indies, or an incredibly ugly one, because what you're looking at as um, probably the, the people without shirts are probably slaves, what's in the barrels is probably rum. You're probably looking at the triangle trade whereby human beings were stolen, uh, kidnapped from Africa to be sold in the West Indies, the Caribbean, uh, the American South. Um, to work in particular on sugar production, which became sugar and rum, which went back to Europe and was then uh, the boats reloaded with the trade goods that were traded for human beings in Africa. So this is actually, you know, is it beautiful or is it ugly? We're going to get back to the triangle trade. So I've been trying to tell other stories with maps. This is from my atlas, uh, Infinite City, a San Francisco atlas. And um, thank you. I agree. Uh, it was a uh, huge... <laughs> No, it was a huge amount of work with a ton of collaborators and a huge amount of fun in a way of discovery, rediscovering the place I've lived most of my life. This is all the original place names as Ohlone and Miwok had them, and as shown to me by an Ohlone guy. It was kind of a shock for me. I've known this place my whole life, and here it was almost entirely with unfamiliar place names. It was a reminder of what else is always there that we don't know. This is kind of a base layer map because it is the people who are here first and to make it a map, and to make it a beautiful map, and to make it available. This is the first time this data was ever published when we put this out in 2010. It was really exciting. And um, so and maps can tell us a lot. This is a map I did with uh, Joshua Jelly Shapiro, the great geographer. Um, that's uh, part of this whole project of maps as counter narratives. It's about the African Americans. There were very few in the Bay Area until World War II when huge numbers of people escaped the Dixie South came for the jobs, and the very freaky thing is that the shipyard jobs, which were all lining the bay, all kind of ended at the end of World War II. Um, but the African American communities are still where they were when the jobs were there, except that there aren't jobs there in West Oakland, in Richmond, in Marin City, in Hunters Point, Bayview, in San Francisco. But out of that immigration came an incredible cultural uh, explosion that includes um, everything from Sly and the Family Stone and the Pointer Sisters to the Black Panthers, which were founded in Oakland in the 60s. And uh, we wanted to make that visible in a region that doesn't have a strong African-American identity a lot of times outside of Oakland and Richmond, and where there, a lot of this history is really invisible, and where gentrification in San Francisco has been pushed the African-American population from about 15% in the 70s to about 7% now. Um, so, you know, alternative versions of cities are one of the things you can do with maps and uh, stories that you don't get told. There's a lot of very specific stuff here. And then also, there tends to be these really kind, kind of dumb consensuses about what places are. And people think San Francisco and the Bay Area is all peace and love and left-wing anti-war politics, except that Condoleezza Rice is at Stanford. And remember all those things I was saying about Google, which I'm going to be hating on some more as we go? Uh, Condoleezza Rice is back at Stanford. The uh, John Yu, the torture memo architect, is tenured at the law school at UC Berkeley. The nation's nuclear weapons uh, facility is run out of Lawrence Livermore Labs and the University of California, which everyone thinks is all free speech movement. Um, so this is a map called The Right Wing of the Dove uh, with art by Sandow Burke about the right wing uh, militarized Bay Area. We are really um, over there, kind of the brains of the Pentagon for better or worse, really for worse. That's not all that's there, though. Some of it's pretty lovable. This is uh, Monarchs and Queens, a map of uh, the 27 remaining, is it 27 or 30-something remaining butterfly species, some of them unique to San Francisco uh, that can be found there, and uh, queer public spaces. Uh, and, uh, and the specificity of maps is pretty exciting. You go all the way back and... Um, and it turns out North Beach, which everyone thinks was full of beatniks, was never really particularly full of beatniks, but it was huge with lesbian bars before there hardly were any gay bars, which is not the official history as it's commonly known. So you get really specific and look at exactly here, exactly here, and it gets very different. I put uh, queer public spaces and butterflies together uh, because they're both kind of, because it's really about San Francisco as a refuge city where things flourish that don't necessarily flourish in other places. 
and I know all that stuff about Stonewall, et cetera, except that we had very open gay public life in San Francisco before Stonewall, because actually trees fall in forests all the time that New York doesn't hear. And, um, <laughs> you know, sorry, New York. <laughs> So, uh, you know, we had a, I, a wonderful guy who just died, Jose Soria, a.k.a. the Empress Jose, uh, ran for public office in San Francisco in 1961 as an out gay uh, drag queen man um, long before Harvey Milk became the first openly gay elected official in San Francisco. So maps, more maps. This is about displaced communities, immigrant Jews, interned Japanese Americans, uh, um, urban renewal clobbered African Americans in what was sometimes thought of as the Harlem of the West. See, here we are back loving uh, New York with this Harlem of the West epithet for the Fillmore District um, that was destroyed in a, uh, the urban renewal that was nicknamed uh, Negro removal um, at times. So, and it's hard to think about cities now without thinking about displacement. This is a map. Somebody just made this uh, season of San Francisco evictions. And to me, it looks like a map of bruises, like a city being punched by money, which is what money's really good at doing. And um, why, why is this happening? Because this is happening. This is the Google bus map. Uh, to Silicon Valley's uh, the great corporate homogenizing intervening force of our consciousness and uh, loss of our privacy is colonizing San Francisco, because uh, even though it's all about privatization, they like public space and dense old-fashioned cities. And, besides which there's no housing left in the suburb that is Silicon Valley. So this is this very cool map somebody made of all the buses. The yellow is the Google, um, taking, making it possible for people to live a hideous rush hour away from San Francisco, uh, from Silicon Valley, um, and ride these private shuttle buses that are literally stopping at public bus stops, and they, only have, they don't have back doors like our buses, and really preventing public transit from functioning. So we have this kind of system for poor people and ordinary people who take public transit, and then these kind of luxury tinted window, uh, privatized Wi-Fi equipped buses pull up and kind of shoulder them out of the way, and the minions of our new alien overlords get into their spaceships to be lifted <laughs> off for Silicon Valley. Not that I'm bitter. But, uh, so and this is back to Infinite City. This is a map I did with Heather. Heather, are you in the house? Yay! I did with Heather Smith. It uh, was really interesting the way you could map a, the centenarian, a centenarian born in San Francisco, in this case four, um, that somebody's whole life could be depicted on a small map like this. And the cartographer Shizu Seagal made their lives into these lines so you could see it as though 100 years of somebody's life had been a single trek around a city in a day. And, um, and then it started to feel pretty sweet. So I found somebody had mapped 500 evictions. And as Heather pointed out, uh, why were these people in San Francisco for a century? Because they actually owned their homes. Uh, scattered all around them, They're like, uh, you know, maybe uh, smallpox uh, sores, you can see evictions in the red dots. So this is some of the stuff I've been trying to map. Uh, Atlas number two is out this week with some parties uh, tomorrow, Monday and Tuesday around New York. And um, it's supposed to be a trilogy. Should I do a New York Atlas? Do you all want to work on it with me? Yeah. Okay, we should have like a... a t uh, so New Orleans, I got real involved with... Thank you. Um, uh, it uh, probably will be. So this, this new book with UC Press is out with about 50 people contributing in various ways. I'm just the kind of the co-circus ringmaster. And um, making these maps is a crazy amount of work and a great adventure. And... Um, New Orleans is a place that got real involved with after Hurricane Katrina, particularly in investigating racial crimes that weren't made visible because the official narrative was about uh, crazy out of control back black people, and even though most of the poor people were actually incredibly altruistic and awesome, and the real violence was the police and the white vigilantes, but that's in my a paradise built in hell. But like a lot of people who came to New Orleans after Katrina, I kind of fell in love with the place and created um, excuses to stick around. And uh, worked with a native New Orleanian, Rebecca Snedeker, because you can't really get too deeply into New Orleans as an outsider without uh, some inside help. This is a map um, that's also trying to address what is a city, where are its boundaries? New Orleans is this, you know, is the white spot right up there. But um, 
In New Orleans is the most incarcerated neighborhood in the most incarcerated city in the most incarcerated state in the most incarcerated country in the world. Central City is that place. And you can really think of the prisons all over Louisiana as suburbs of inner city New Orleans. And this is a map of these failed systems of containment that attempt to control people through uh, prisons to control water through levees and the huge water systems on the Mississippi. The way that they've failed over and over, the way that people and water insist on being free. And um, so and this is an unfinished version. There's this one with a slightly better orange loop. I was talking about the triangle trade. Uh, this is a map. Uh, this is my anti-triangle trade map because we talk all the time about the triangle trade. So what came with those Africans from Africa when they came to the New World? Memory and culture came. In the United States, those things survived in New Orleans as no place else and became the foundation of most of the popular music you've ever listened to in your life, including jazz, R&B, rock and roll, and, um, and everything that came out of those. And you know, and during the Arab Spring, I was so moved to see that hip hop was a big part of the Arab Spring in different ways, and we call it the Arab Spring. We could have called it the North African Spring because it was all across North Africa. And to see this music that had ultimately come from Africa go back to Africa as part of, the, part of liberation was kind of amazing. And so this is a map of that history and its specifics in New Orleans of uh, both the music and the liberation and um, the traditions of resistance and the kind of larger world in which these things circulate because the boundaries of a city, you know, maybe every place it's ever listened to the music that came from New Orleans is New Orleans, which is why we claim it's immortal, even though it'll probably um, get really troubled by sea level rise and uh, climate change it is already. So, um, so another map about this, this is an early one. That's not supposed to be a negative image. I thought I had the right one. Uh, it's called Where Day At, Bounce Calls Up a B Vanished City. How many of you know about bounce music? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, there will be no twerking on this stage. But um, maybe later. Maybe Mel Chin will do some twerking for you. But, um, so, but this is where it's all born. And what's crazy, it came out of the housing projects. And what you might, you, you sounds like a lot of you know about the ass shaking, sexy parts of bounce. What you might not know about it is it's deeply and passionately geographical. As New Orleanians have a relationship to place and a sense of memory and a sense of public life that's sort of missing to comparatively in the rest of the United States. And you shout, you shout out about your housing projects, the schools you went to, et cetera. And after Katrina, the projects got shuttered. The schools all turned into kind of conservative, sometimes militarized charter schools and their names got changed. And so this is a whole map of a New Orleans that disappeared everywhere except in music where it lives on and uh, with fantastic art, an amazing essay by uh, the New York music writer from Jamaica, Garnett Cadigan. And I, um, so, and you know, there's so much more I could say. I see this thing sort of, I don't know if you know, we have this clicker, I'm at 18 minutes and seven seconds. And uh, so this is, you know, this is the last map I'm gonna show you. It's called Lead and Lies, Mouths Full of Poison. It's about what you don't see in cities that shape them anyway. Uh, that's the, the base map is a map some scientists made of lead concentrations in the soil in uh, New Orleans. Uh, the map's gorgeous because the designer Leah Chandra at UC Press tends to make everything that way. And the ornaments covering it like uh, that looks so ornamental from a distance, each of them is a lie in history. For example, at uh, May 25th, 1862, General Butler of the Union Army infamously decrees that either women of New Orleans will pretend that they don't despise the occupying Union Army, or the Army will pretend that they are members of a despised profession, prostitutes. Uh, it, uh, you know, and it goes on to um, Congressman uh, William Jefferson's uh, sentence to 13, actually almost, at New Orleans now, I think the mayor's on trial, uh, the congressman's in, in prison, they've got, uh, you know, they've got a level of corruption there that's pretty amazing. And that, so this kind of corrosion you don't see, because that's one of the things I'm interested in. What do you not see on a conventional map? How do you make it visible? How, you know, how, how does this process of making visible bring us more deeply into cities? And we talk about it often as stories, as visual representation, but there's something that happens with maps in particular that gives you that precision and specificity I've been having a lot of fun with lately that lets you talk about 
the Silicon Valley takeover of San Francisco or, to, or toxicology or rising ocean water or original place names as nothing else does. So um, I'm not sure that was a keynote, but I am sure that it's 19 minutes and 58 seconds. <laughs> so thank you so much. Yeah.